So as we get into this text, I want to remind you first that this text is going to continue to drive home the theme that Mark has been giving us through the last couple chapters of his gospel. The theme is that Jesus is God. Jesus is the son of God. If you've been with us the last couple of weeks, you know that Jesus has told five parables about that. He has since calmed a storm to prove that to us. And once again, he is proving that to us in this text. Uh, the way that Mark shows us this is by giving us this little nugget at the end of the text. Uh, he says that Jesus says to the demon possessed man, tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell how much Jesus had done for him. See, by switching those nouns, Lord and Jesus, Mark is clearly communicating. This is once again, a story about how Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is God. Jesus has power over the natural world in the storms, and he has power over the supernatural world with the demons. So I don't want to spend more time on that than just this moment, because we've been covering that for the last couple of weeks. But it's a good reminder for us that the Bible is not fundamentally about us. It is fundamentally about Jesus and his work on our behalf as God come in human flesh to die for humanity so that humanity could live. It's not a story about how you can become more prosperous or successful or accomplish your goals or be a better person. It is about how God has saved you from yourself. But rather than belabor that point, I want to get into this text because this text has a lot for us to learn. And I think it's super practical for us. So the text starts this way. It says, they went across the lake to the region of the Gerizines. Now, I'm guessing you have no idea where the Gerizines is. Um, So thankfully for you, I put a map on the page for you. This is the Sea of Galilee. And that arrow that is on the right side, that red arrow on the right side of the Sea of Galilee, is pointing to the region of the Gerizines. Now, the region of the Gerizines is kind of like the province of Ontario. It's a larger area. But specifically, the arrow is pointing at where the best scholars think that this event actually happened. But what's most important about this place is that it is a Gentile territory. So throughout Mark's gospel up to this point, he has been in Judea. He's been serving the Jews, but now he has crossed over the lake from the red arrow that's on the left side of the screen, which is pointing at Capernaum to the Gentile side of the Sea of Galilee. And now he's interacting with the Gentiles. Now, why I point this out is what Jesus is, is parallel to what Jesus did in chapter one of Mark. So if you go back to chapter one of Mark, Mark starts the gospel with a prologue saying, this is about the son of God, Jesus. Then he says, Jesus is baptized. Jesus starts his ministry. And the first story that Mark records, Jesus doing in Judea is driving out a demon. Go look this up in Mark chapter one. Now fast forward to Mark chapter five. And what is the first thing that Jesus does when he gets into Gentile territory? Drives out a demon. Uh, There's definitely a parallel between these two accounts. Mark Mark 1, excuse me, showing that that Jesus drives out a demon in Jew country and Mark 5 saying that he drives out a demon in Gentile country. Now, there are two big implications from this idea. Um, The first of those is that Jesus comes for all people, which may not seem like that radical of a thought to us, but it was a radical thought at that time and actually continues to be a pretty radical thought today. A couple of weeks ago, I said that in general at this time, people's religion was determined primarily by their ethnicity. Uh, But what the text is telling us here is that Jesus is coming for Jew and Gentile. He's coming for all people, regardless of ethnic background, which of course would have been a crazy thought to both Jews and Gentiles. The Gentiles didn't want the Jewish religion. The Jews didn't want the Gentiles, but Jesus says he comes for all of them. And that continues to be true even today. Um, I I mentioned uh, last week or two weeks ago, excuse me, um, that Christianity is the most all-inclusive religion on the face of the earth. It is the only religion that welcomes people into complete membership in its teachings, regardless of age or sex or ability or intellect. Um, It is a grace-based religion. There is no metric you have to hit to be part of uh, of God's family. And that actually has played itself out historically too. If you look across the world, Christianity is pretty evenly spread across every continent. About 20% or so of Christians live on each of the continents. Not so with any other world religion. Every other world religion is contained on basically one or maybe two continents. It's because Christianity is a religion that goes beyond borders. It goes beyond culture. It goes beyond the normal way that people think. I would say because it comes from God, not from humans. Uh, But there's a second thing, and I think a more important point for us today that comes from this idea of the demon possession being the first thing Jesus deals with both in Judea and in Gentile country. And that's that he's saying Jews and Gentiles have the same problem. 
So the first thing that Jesus comes to solve in both places is demon possession. And that would have been a radical thought too. Maybe the Jews would have thought of the Gentiles. Well, they're the ones who are being acted upon by demons or the Gentiles would have thought about the Jews. They're the ones who get the spiritual realm wrong. But Jesus says, no, everyone's got the same spiritual problem. The religious people and the irreligious people have the same spiritual problem. And so I think we can extrapolate this idea a little bit to say that really Christians and non-Christians today still have the same problem. What is that problem? I would say that problem is that we are all possessed by something. Now I realize when you start talking about demons and demonic possession and those sorts of things, people get a little bit skeptical. Maybe you're watching this and you're thinking to yourself, I don't believe that demons really even exist. Or maybe you believe that they exist, but you don't really think they're active in your everyday life. I hope to move the needle a little bit on that with you today help you at least wrestle with the ideas of personal, powerful, evil, spiritual forces in your life. But even if you would not move on that idea at all, if you would just stick with what you believe right now, I think you actually can still agree with this idea that we are all possessed by something. See, every one of us, religious or irreligious, has something behind our reason for existing. Like the reason we wake up in the morning, the reason we go to work, the reason we take care of our kids, the reason we don't go out and commit crimes or whatever it is, is all compelled by a big principle that's behind our life. Maybe the principle for you is, I want to be successful and significant. I want people to know my name. I don't want people to think that I'm a failure. Maybe it's you want to be comfortable. I don't really want a lot, but I also don't want to be poor. Maybe it's that you're trying to prove something to somebody. That's what my dad said about me when I was a kid. I'm going to prove him wrong. Maybe it's just that you don't want to get in trouble. Constantly just trying to avoid getting in any sort of trouble. Every one of us has a principle, something that's driving why we wake up in the morning and do life the way that we do it. The, the reason that we choose to go to the schools that we go to or not go to. The reason we shop at the places we shop or don't shop. The reason we buy the things that we buy or don't buy. The reason that we hang out with the type of people that we hang out with. All of it comes back to one core principle. It's something that drives us. And as much as we would like to think that we are autonomous and free and we choose all these things for ourselves, really there's a core principle that's driving all of it. And odds are you didn't choose it for yourself. Just to give you an example of this. Why is it that for most of human history, children have generally taken on the career path of their parents? So if you know, your daddy was a butcher, you become a butcher kind of thing. Well, I would say it's because they're seeing that life, they're experiencing it, they're seeing the value in it, and maybe their family is saying, this would be a good thing for you to do next, and so they continue in that career path. But why is it now that more and more children are not taking on the career path of their parents? because they have different influences, right? They have the internet that allows them to see all different types of careers. They have job fairs and things like this that they can see at school that there are other ways to do your life. And so their influences push them down a certain career path. Nothing really fundamentally changed about humanity. What changed is our influences and therefore we started making different choices. See, every one of us is driven by something. And it's probably something we didn't really choose. It was more so a product of our environment. And so whether you believe that demons are real or not, I think you can agree with this idea that we are all possessed by something. And Jesus' main point in this text is that that something ought to be him. That he ought to be the reason you get up in the morning. That he ought to be the reason you go to work. That he ought to be the reason you pick the friends that you pick. That he ought to be the reason that you are generous or not generous to certain people in certain situations, etc. Like Jesus has to be that main operating principle. And, and here's why. Not just because Jesus is like some control freak or narcissistic and wants you to just listen to whatever he says. He's doing that because it's beneficial for you. See, every other operating principle will demand everything of you and curse you when you fail. Just to use an example, like if you think that you know, success in the job market is like your operating principle, like you just want to be a successful working person, that will demand a lot of you. It will demand your time and your energy and your resources. And if you fail, if you're not good enough, you will either get laid off or fired or not be able to work in that career path. It will demand everything of you and it will curse you if you fail. What about a relationship? If you feel like, you know, if I'm just in a good relationship, then, then I'm somebody, then I'm okay. That's going to demand everything of you. 
going to demand your time and your energy and your resources to keep that relationship good. And if you're not that good of a husband or a wife or a boyfriend or a girlfriend or whatever, you're going to lose that relationship. But Jesus is different. Jesus doesn't demand everything of you. He gives everything to you. He gives you his life. He gives you eternity. He gives you all the resources of heaven. And when you fail, he doesn't curse you. He forgives you. He picks you back up and says, I paid for that sin too. I've redeemed you to be my child. Go be my child in the world. See, whether you believe this text is about demons or not, we're all driven by something. And Jesus wants that something to be us. And so what this text is going to teach us is how Jesus drives away the other things that possess our life and puts us on a path to being possessed or pushed or compelled or driven by him. So we're going to look at three sets of characters in the story, and we're going to walk through each of them and see what they teach us about this principle. We're going to look at the demons, the pigs, and then the man. First of all, the demons. The text says, after they went over to the Gerizines, Jesus got out of the boat and a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot and he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. So Jesus runs into this guy with an impure spirit. And we need to talk about that because in 21st century Western world, places like we are watching from, this seems a little bit weird. Uh, Most modern people would say that they think that demons don't really exist, or if they exist, they're not really active in my life. And more often than not, the excuse that is given for that sort of belief is looking at these biblical texts and saying, well, these people, they were ancient people. They were pre-modern people. They were pre-science people. They didn't understand things that we understand today, like mental illness, like you know, schizophrenia and Tourette's and, and multiple personality disorder and, and this sort of thing. They didn't understand that, so they just explained it all away as demon possession. And we're better now because we have science and we understand these things. We're not like those ancient people. I would challenge you and say, I think that's an insufficient way to look at reality. And I actually want to give you five reasons why I think that's insufficient. So I want to give you a textual reason, a historical reason, a societal reason, a personal reason, and a theological reason. Okay, so first, a textual reason. Uh, As you read this text, I think it's impossible to read this text and see it as possibly anything other than demonic possession uh, because of the pigs. So if you met this guy, you know, he's crying out in the, in the caves, he's cutting himself. You could say, yeah, maybe this guy is suffering from depression or from some sort of personality disorder or bipolar or something like this. You maybe could diagnose that. But then you have to account for the fact that when Jesus drives out this demon, this whole herd of pigs, 2,000 of them just barrel down a mountain into the sea and drown themselves. That's not something that 2,000 head of pig do very often. So the text just doesn't read in a way that would allow you to explain this away with something like mental illness. Secondly, a historical reason. As you read the rest of the Gospels, you'll realize that the Gospel writers are careful to distinguish between physical ailments, mental ailments, and spiritual ailments. Uh, Particularly Luke, the Gospel writer Luke, is good at this because he himself is a medical doctor. And so he understands very clearly the difference between something that is physical, something that is mental, and something that is spiritual. And so he uses particular technical language to distinguish between those things. To say that these people were ancient and they didn't understand things like mental illness is, well, frankly, not reading the text. And is somewhat arrogant to think that your culture and your time and history is somehow better than everyone else's. Third, a societal reason why I don't think that's a sufficient way to look at the world is that in general, when we look at the world and see heinous crime, Uh, we try to explain it away using hyper-simplistic definitions. So I've I've gone into more depth on this in a previous sermon on demon possession from Mark chapter 1, so I'm going to keep it short here. But the basic idea is when we see heinous crime, we tend to either boil it down to societal causes, like lack of education, poverty, oppression, those sorts of things, or we boil it down to moral causes. So like, you know, there's fatherlessness in the home, or like Christianity is on the decline in, in this country, and therefore these sorts of things happen. But both of those ways of looking at it are insufficient because they're inconsistent. So yes, there's like a correlation between crime rates and poverty or crime rates and lack of education, but there are people who are living in poverty who have no education who are not committing crimes. 
they can't say that that's the only reason or that's the reason for it. In the same way with moral objections. Yeah, there's a correlation between fatherlessness and crime rates. However, there are a whole bunch of people who did not have a father in their life who are very pleasant, upstanding citizens. And so you can't just boil it down to one of those two things. You have to actually have a complex view of the human person. And what nobody seems to factor in is the possibility that maybe there is evil coming from the outside of humanity. A test of this is just to realize that one of the most highly educated societies in the entire world, the German nation around 1945 or so, was capable of some of the most heinous things that we've ever seen. And some of the most moral people, people that were part of the church, committed atrocious crimes in the name of well, being part of the church. And so just being moral or just being educated, those things are not sufficient for actually curbing human evil. You have to have this concept of outside evil if you're going to be able to make sense of the evil in the world. Fourth, a personal reason. I bet just about every one of you who's watching this has some behavior in your life that you know is bad, you don't want to do it, you know how to fix it, but you aren't. You know it's bad, you don't want to do it, you know how to fix it, but you don't fix it. If we are purely material, if there's no outside spiritual forces acting on our life, why would that be the case? Why couldn't we just figure it out? I would lead you to at least consider the possibility that there are some evil forces on the outside of you that are pushing you in this direction. You can see that in the text, right? This guy is doing self-destructive behaviors. I'm sure he didn't want to end up in the tombs cutting himself and yelling out. But over time, those things built up and built up and, well, that's where he ended up. Even the text tells us that people were trying to bind him at some points. And so it was obvious that other people in his community were seeing this as self-destructive behavior, but he continued to do it. People were talking to him and saying, hey, this is not good. You shouldn't be like this, but he kept down that path. Could it be that maybe in your life, you don't have thousands of demons, but maybe you have a couple? Maybe the difference between you and this man is not quality, but quantity of demonic activity. Fifth reason why I think it's an insufficient worldview is a theological reason. And so this is particularly for those of you who call yourselves Christians. Um, one of the core values of being theologically conservative Protestants, which is what we are, is that we love scripture alone. It's one of our core values. It's one of the things we base how we do church on. Uh, the idea is that we always go back to the Bible for all of our answers, for all of our truth, for all of our knowledge about God. We don't care what any pastor or priest or pope says if it does not line up with scripture. And that's a beautiful thing, but it also has unintended consequences sometimes. And one of those unintended consequences is that for theologically conservative Protestants like us, we pretty quickly dismiss things from the supernatural realm because we can't test it. We can't test it against scripture. Let me see if this resonates with you. Um, have you ever been in a conversation with somebody who talks about some sort of supernatural thing happening around them? So maybe they like saw an angel or they felt like a demon's presence in their house or, or they had like some sort of vision or dream or something like this. Is your initial reaction to that to like rationalize it away? Just like think of a whole bunch of rational explanations for how that happened? Now understand not all those things are necessarily spiritual activity. They can be things like mental illness, of course. There's some play in between those things. But I think our reaction to immediately dismiss those things shows that we have lost a concept of the spiritual realm being active in our lives, even as conservative theological Protestants. Dr. Michael Heiser, he's a world-renowned biblical or Hebrew scholar. Uh, he wrote this critique of theologically conservative Protestants, which he is one. So he's critiquing his own church body, but I thought this was just so powerful. Um, and I'll paraphrase it. He said, basically, the only reason that theologically conservative Protestants believe in a triune God is because the religion doesn't make sense without him. Like they have to have that character in order to do what they want to do on earth in their church, their social club that they call church. But then they don't functionally live like the demons or the angels or even really that spiritual God are present or active in their life at all. He said, essentially what people do in our tradition is we tend to make everything about script or everything about religion academic. Here are the points. Here are the fill in the blanks. Here are the one, two, threes. Here's what you got to know. And that's it. 
Now we have to be careful because obviously the Bible is revealing knowledge to us and we should learn these things and memorize these things and apply these things to our life. But if we reduce it down to only academic things, we lose the biblical worldview, which is full of things of the spiritual realm. Essentially, if, if we don't have a concept of the spiritual realm active in our life, we might as well just run a social club for being better moral people. Because that's essentially what church is without an understanding of the spiritual realm. And so for all those reasons, I think the idea that this is not a true story or that this didn't really happen or that demons don't really exist, I think is an insufficient way of looking at the text. Now, like I said, you don't have to agree with me. I think you can still get the point from this text, but I hope you're at least willing to consider the possibility or even probability that demons are active, personal, powerful, spiritual forces in our lives. Let's continue with the text. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. Now I want to stop here for a second and again, focus on the demons and look how they react to Jesus. Uh, They immediately fall on the ground and confess who he is. And the reason I want you to notice that is I think sometimes we get this idea that the demons are like worse than us. Like we're bad. We're sinful. We admit that we confess that, but like the demons, they're real bad. (laughs) They're like super evil, all the way evil. I want to challenge you on that thought because of what the demon does here when he sees Jesus. See, the demon immediately falls down before Jesus and confesses who he is, confesses that he is God. But now compare that to the average human being. When they're confronted with God in his word, how do they react? Do they immediately fall at his feet? Do they immediately confess his name? Or can they sometimes not be bothered to pay attention? Or sometimes not be bothered to get out of bed in the morning? Or sometimes not be bothered to actually take time to open their Bible in the first place? See, the difference between the demons and humans is that both are evil but one of them is willing to admit that it's evil. The demons are willing when they see a perfect holy God to say, we are not, we better get down on our face and beg for mercy. The other thinks it's doing okay. Thinks it doesn't really need God all the time. Thinks God is nice, maybe a a means to an end, but not the almighty perfect God in whose presence I cannot stand. I think that ought to challenge us, especially those of us who called ourselves Christians. Is this our attitude toward God? Is our attitude one of repentance? Is our attitude one of humility before him? Or is our attitude one of cavalierly asking him to help us accomplish our goals in life, to be our buddy on our side while we do what we want to do? The demons know what's right, even though they're very evil. Maybe we could learn something. The text continues. Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied for we are many. I don't have time to really go into this today, but I did put this in your life group discussions. So on the backside of your notes sheet, you'll find the life group discussion questions. I want you to wrestle with this idea of what it means to have many demons and how that affects a person. But what we find out here is that there are thousands of demons living in this man. Um, A Roman legion was usually about 4,000 to 6,000 soldiers. The pigs, there's 2,000 of them. So we don't really know whether there were 2,000 demons or 4,000 demons or 6,000 demons. The point is there's a lot of them. And obviously this is very adversely affecting this guy's livelihood. Um, He begs Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. And so a large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs and allow us to go into them. So he gave them permission. The impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Now there's a little bit of scholarly debate about exactly where this happened, uh, but the scholars that I trust say that it happened right here. This is a place uh, just on the east side of the Sea of Galilee where that little red arrow was pointing. You can look it up on Google Maps, not right now, but after worship. It's a place called Kersey Beach, Kersey National Park. Um, It's probably the best location for what happened here, as you can see, because of these steep cliffs that lead down into the water. You can think of it, 2,000 pigs running down the hill, all drowning themselves. And maybe our first reaction is, oh, those poor little pigs. (laughs) But I think we have to ask a bigger question, which is like, why? 
why is this what happened? Why did Jesus let them into the, in, into the pigs in the first place? And then why did these pigs go barreling down into the water? I think there are a couple explanations, but probably the best one that I've found is that they are trying to get Jesus in trouble. 2,000 pigs is worth a lot of money. Uh, I don't really know exactly what a head of pig is going for today, but I did look up a place in Brampton that does pig roasts and their smallest package for a whole pig roast is $375. So $375 times 2,000. I know we all just did our taxes, but you can do this with me. That's like three quarters of a million dollars, right? That's a lot of money that was just lost. And so maybe the demons are trying to get, that, get Jesus in trouble with the local people who own these pigs. Well, turns out it kind of works at first. Uh, the text tells us that those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and in the countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to saw, see Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by a legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. And then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. So it does seem to get Jesus in trouble, doesn't it? Like all these people come out and they say, you got to leave Jesus. But I think in that we see another diagnosis of the human condition, right? Why do they ask him to leave? They ask him to leave because he just lost them three quarters of a million dollars. Like they saw the man, they saw what he did. They saw that that guy who they all thought was weird living out in the caves, cutting himself is now seated, dressed in his right mind, but that wasn't worth it to them. That amount of money was not enough to pay for that man's life. And so I think we need to wrestle with this question to us. How much is a life worth? To them, it wasn't worth $750,000 or at least the equivalent in their wealth at that time. How much is it worth to you? How much of your money or your time or your resources is a life worth? I think sometimes in, in modern Christianity, we think that a life is worth whatever I have in surplus. Like if I have financial stability, then I'll donate to that cause. Or if it fits in my schedule, then I'll be there. Or if it doesn't make me uncomfortable, then I'll do it. But when it comes to actually sacrificially living, taking our wealth or our resources or our time and using them to help the people of the community around us, both in physical ways and in spiritual ways, I think we have a, a struggle getting over that sacrificial hump. Notice Jesus was willing to give $750,000 of someone else's money in order to save this man's life. And I wonder if there isn't something for us to learn in that as well. That Jesus is going to save people in this world, in this city, through our sacrifice, through our willingness to be uncomfortable, through our willingness to maybe live on a little bit less than what we make, for our willingness to sell some of our possessions. Let me think about it. Some of you own a house that's worth $750,000. Would you sell it? Give away all the money? If it meant saving one person's life? Would you sell it and give it away if that one person's life was somebody who was a crazy person living under the gardener in Toronto? Because that would be the equivalent person in our society today. I'm not saying you should do that. I don't think the text is necessarily calling you to do that. But I am asking you to test your limits. What sort of sacrifice are you actually willing to give so that people can be saved? Is it just your extra? It's just what you can afford? Or are you willing to look at sacrifice the way Jesus looks at sacrifice? That everything that I have been given is a means to helping other people in spiritual and in physical ways. One of the ways that I've been wrestling with this in my own personal life is with the idea of hospitality. Uh, I've been confronted by what the Bible says about hospitality more and more, partially through my own Bible study, partially through my wife. And so we've been thinking about this, like what is hospitality going to look like? Um, you know, when the world opens up again, are we going to be willing to welcome people into our houses? Will we be like Jesus and eat with tax collectors and sinners? 
I'll tell you, that makes me uncomfortable even just talking about it right now because that means I'm going to lose privacy. I'm going to have people in my house that I don't know, that I don't trust. They're going to be around my girls. I'm going to have to raise my grocery budget. I'm not going to have the freedom to do whatever I want every evening. I'm going to lose a lot of things that are my normal way of living. But Jesus calls me to that. What is Jesus calling you to right now? Is it maybe time to downsize? Is it maybe time to get rid of one of your cars? Is it time to think about maybe not going on that vacation or going on a vacation closer to home? Is it maybe not time to not put your kids in all of those programs so that you have the time, so you have the money, so you have the energy to save people? This man's life wasn't just worth $750,000 of another person's money to Jesus. It was worth his own life. See, what we see here is Jesus switching places with the man. Think about it. At the beginning of this text, this man is bleeding, crying out, dying essentially among tombs, naked. By the end of the text, he's clothed in his right mind, speaking plainly. The beginning of the text, Jesus is clothed and in his right mind, speaking plainly. But by the end of this gospel, he's naked, bleeding, crying out from a cross as he dies and is eventually buried in a tomb. Jesus switched places with the man. It wasn't just worth money to him. It was worth his entire life. And your life is worth that much to him too. And I think only when you realize that will you be able to live in that self-sacrificial way. Only when you realize that your life was destined for hell, but that God changed your path, altered your afterlife to being on a path to heaven, that you're willing to say the resources that I have in this world, the comfortability that I have in this world, all of it is temporary, so I might as well use it to save other people. Only when you understand that will you be able to live in that way. And that's exactly what happened. The text tells us that as, the, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Who was willing to go on an adventure, to put themselves in an uncomfortable place, to do something they've never, never done before? The man who realized what Jesus had, did for, for, had done for him. But Jesus doesn't let him come. The text tells us that Je- Jesus didn't let him, but said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord had done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. Jesus wants you to go to your people. Go back to your home, the people that you know, the people who he has put in your life, and tell them what Jesus has done for you. If you know this message of what Jesus has done, then you are the best qualified person to reach the people in your life. The people you know are not the people I know. People you know are not the people the rest of the people in our church know. You know them. You're in their life. Go tell them what Jesus did for you. You know, I'm not a big fan of testimonials in public worship because I'm pretty convinced worship should be about God, not about our lives. But the Bible is very clear that testimonials are one of the most valuable resources when it comes to sharing your faith with other people. A lot of times we think sharing our faith has to have like a technical knowledge of whether creation is true or evolution is true or, or what Jesus is like, what's his nature, well, how do you figure out the Trinity, what's going to happen at the end of the world, what is baptism, all these sorts of things. And there's value in knowing those things for sure. But, but Jesus says, just tell him what I did for you. Just share who you were and who you are now. Can you do that? Can you look at your life and say, you know what, I would have been on that path if it weren't for Jesus. And Jesus saved my marriage. Jesus saved my life. Jesus gave me purpose. Jesus gave me peace. I'm the person I am today, not because I made myself this way, but because of Jesus. It's going to be uncomfortable. I'm sure that man didn't like reliving that episode of his life where he was demon possessed, crying out, cutting himself in the caves. But because he was willing to talk about that, he was able to show the surpassing greatness of God's grace to him. Can you do the same thing? So one last application for today. I think we need to admit the activity of the demons in our lives. Think about who this man was. Uh, He was a man participating in self-destructive behaviors. He knew those behaviors were bad. 
He knew those behaviors alienated him from society and people tried to help him reform all of those behaviors, but they eventually gave up on him. And that might be some of you. You're not that far down the road, but you're starting down that path. You got something in your life, you know it's wrong. You don't want to do it. You know how to fix it, but you can't. Is it sex? Is it money? Is it alcohol? Is it body image? Is it reputation? What is that thing that's driving you? Come to the only thing that will drive you and will not demand everything of you, but will bless you when you fail. And then notice this one last thing. This is the way to drive this into your heart. And if you forgot everything else that I said today, learn this. The text tells us that the man was bound at one time, but no one was able to bind him anymore. I think that's really significant. See, our reaction when we see sin in our life or in somebody else's life is to try to bind it, to try to enact more willpower, to try harder, to build in accountability, to do whatever we can to try to rid ourselves of that sin, or we try to do it to somebody else. They need more rules, more consequences. They need to feel bad about what they're doing. We tend to bind when we see sin, but Jesus doesn't. He doesn't bring down some like divine bounds that can keep this man from ever doing anything evil again. Even the demons can't break Jesus' chains. No, he, he frees him. He lets him go. He takes his place, absorbs his sin, and lets him go free. And that may seem like the most counterintuitive thing ever. You're telling me that if I actually want to change, I have to stop trying to change? You're telling me that if I want that person to change, I have to stop trying to change them? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Because that's what Jesus did. He absorbed the evil and he let the other person go free. So if you're struggling against sin right now, let Jesus absorb the evil. Your years or weeks or months, multiple times of falling into whatever it is that is so self-destructive in your life, it is forgiven. Jesus absorbed it. He died for it. He cried out in pain from it, but then it was over. It was finished. You are free. Today you live with a completely clear slate, fully righteous in Jesus. And you might fail today, but Jesus died for that sin too. Only when you realize that sort of freedom that the gospel gives you, will you be able to fight against any of Satan's temptations. And then as you think about how you deal with other people, rather than trying to bind them, to control them, to make their life look the way you want it to look, absorb their evil, forgive them. And counterintuitively, you will find that that actually produces the greatest change in people. It may take time, but it's worth it. Because Jesus said it was worth it. So what are you possessed by? Pray that it's Jesus. Look to him to be the one who will take your evil and possess you to do what is good, what is right, what is self-sacrificial for others. God grant it. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, we are attacked regularly by the evil personal powerful forces of this world. And we can't stand up against it. Everyone who is listening to my voice right now has something going on in their life that is destroying them from the inside out, God. And so I ask that you would deliver us from those things. Deliver us first by the gospel. Forgive us of our sins. Remind us of who you have made us in Jesus. And then we ask that you would work powerfully in our lives to rid ourselves of those sins. Pray that you build community around each one of us. People who can support and love us. Not by binding us, by pushing us to be better by loving us, forgiving us, and absorbing our evil. I ask that our church be that kind of place in our community as well. As so many people are running around crazed, trying to figure out how to control the world, may we be a community of sacrifice for this, for this city. I ask all those things in your name. Amen.